So that's that's another like I live with two mini like uh, flux capacitors. Like they're like two mini DeLoreans, like that just uh, make time fuck around with me in front of my face. And but yet my day to day is almost identical. Wake up, put kid on bus, or wake up, make breakfast, put kid on bus, make comics, come home, make dinner, put kids in bed, rinse and repeat, right? And that they're growing. And then you feel like, especially, I don't even know, if, I, don't, I don't even know, like now that I'm on the writing side of things for a lot more over the last five or six years, and, and you can speak to this because we're, we, we share a lot of that, that those same threads of, of living on both sides of the line. When you draw a book, it's like you, you live in this, in a time vacuum, right? Because as a writer, you write f five monthly books and you switch these books and you jump on this book. But as an artist, I mean, you've been on Southern Bachelors how many years? Four, Four years, years, right? Yeah. And it, there's this much of the story and there's this much left to go. But yet, and that, so that's this chunk of your life, like working on Wizard of Oz. I tried to explain to somebody, was like, they put the omnibus out. The omnibus is like, you know, 1,200 pages. It's like, it's uh, like 50 some issues. And it's about five and a half, six years of my life, right? And they're like, how does that feel? I was like, to like, look at this. And I picked it up and I was like, inside of this book is three cities, three homes, a brother who had a heart transplant, a dad who died, a kid that was born, like, a dog that was lived, another dog, like a life. Like there was like a giant chunk of, of a life happened. And then that fucks with you because all it is is a book. <laughs> like it's like a, it's a book with pages that if somebody wanted to, they could read it by tomorrow. <laughs> I feel like most of the time artists like to sit in front of stages, especially when we give interviews about things we've done or we're talking about our own work. Oh, it gets real fucking romantic. Yeah, doesn't yeah it? we like to as ascribe all these motivations that they may, you may have made something with purpose. Sure. But everything that you're figuring out afterward is kind of yeah. you being analytical and self. Yeah, it's easy to tell you how you made it through the maze, but most of the time when you're looking through the maze, you're just like, oh, fuck, this is the wrong way. Oh, fuck, this is the wrong way. And right. eventually... You find your way. It's, it's funny because one of my least romantic stories of, of one of my choices is the Oz, to take to do the Oz books in Marvel. Mm -hmm. Because when they, it goes back to that era when I was deciding to chain, you know, I was working, working during the day with this clean style, but at this drink and draw doing this loose style. And at the time, uh, Marvel called up and we were like, I was working on New X-Men. Marvel was like, I think we're, we, we have an idea of that we'd like to, uh, to talk to you about for your next book. And I was like, oh, cool, like, I'm on new X-Men. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the next level X-Men, right? Like, and they're like, all right, we're thinking about adapting The Wizard of Oz. And I was like, oh, shit, what? <laughs> <laughs> now, what they didn't know at the time was I, the night before, had had a bunch of people over to my house and we watched Return of Oz. Mm -hmm. so we had a Return to Oz night, because it's so trippy. And they don't really, Marvel didn't really know a lot of, the editors didn't know a lot about me as a, you know, on a personal level that knew that Labyrinth's one of my favorite movies, that Never Ending Story is one of my favorite movies. So, The Wizard of Oz makes way more sense for me to actually do than any superhero book that I'd ever draw. But they didn't know that. They just were like, he has a cartoon style, blah, 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 we're trying to do this thing. But I thought that it was a terrible career decision because right. at the time, kids' books didn't sell. They were a death nail. Uh, cartoony stuff was didn't sell. It was a death nail. And all of a sudden I'm like, I just had a really successful run on an X book. Oh yeah. And then you want me to go, y'all hate me. Like you just wanna <laughs> you wanna get me on yeah, a yeah, you wanna put sabotage. me on an adaptation. Yeah, they were sending you to the glue they, farm. They was. Yeah. <laughs> they wanna put me on, on an adaptations kids book. And I thought, oh, so I actually said no. I said, I, I think it's a bad choice for me. I want to try to do more than Spider-Man or X-Men, you know. And Dan Buckley and David Gabriel, to their credit, they kept, over the course of two weeks, kept calling. It was like, they, well, it's however many issues you want. It's whatever schedule you want. You get more money. And I was like, why are they doing this? Like, and each time they kept saying, I, I kept saying no until finally I was like, okay, look, 
give me a cover gig in the regular Marvel Universe. I ended up getting de some Deadpool covers. So I, because I, again, I thought I need to stay relevant right. to the comic book community, to the retailers, to not be forgotten. Because I, I was. Well, thought, you probably, that's probably true. You yeah, probably did need to. I thought yeah. for sure I was going to vanish into the cobwebbed corner where the kids' books are hidden uh, for a year or two. And I said, so, I'll, okay, I'll do this one Wizard of Oz, and next year I'll come back if you guys let me do a Spider-Man book. Okay, yeah, cool. And that, my attitude on that may sound flippant or negative, but my attitude on that ended up being serving me the best. Because I assumed that it would not work, I genuinely took them up on you can draw however you want. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I threw away all that, you know, that in, intended thinking of how to mm -hmm. do something and just drew. You know, I had, I don't even know if this is cool to admit, but for, the, for once there was no books in, near my table anymore, right. right? No book of how did he draw? Oh, yeah, yeah How sure. did so-and-so yeah. draw a brick? And, and, and Oz was really that first time where I, no, there was just nothing. It was me, paper, and brushes, and it, what happened happened. And I really, truly thought that it would be not a success. I thought that nobody would read it, and it ended up being, I was so wrong. We, we ended up outselling the biggest events in the superhero side of Marvel. Mm -hmm. We were on the New York Times bestsellers list for two straight years. Right. Wow. We, we on four Eisners. <laughs> with that. So it ended up changing my life, my career, everything, based on what I thought to be a bad choice. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So that, that, that speaks to what he was saying is, it's easy, to, it's easy for me to say, like, oh, well, um, we all got into an Oz just seemed like, we were really filling a hole that needed to be filled. And I could yeah. easily romanticize that era, but it wasn't. It was, it was me, me, me giving up and saying, fine, I'll do whatever you want me to do, and, and thinking it was going to be bad, and it was great. It was the right place, right time, and accident. Right place, right time is huge. And without going yeah. on a tangent about it, Spider-Gwen's the same way. Yeah. Spider-Gwen was essentially, I had a bad experience on, an, on a book, a horrible one, and Marvel was essentially like, but we want to keep you involved. Here's this one shot. Do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I literally said to Robbie, I was like, this might be my last Marvel writing gig. So <laughs> let's just do yeah. whatever. Right. Like, let's just do whatever we want with it. You know, let's have fun. You know what I love about that story? And I think is it doesn't matter. You know, we joke about how long I've been doing this or how long any of us have been doing this. But that feeling never actually changes. So... Even up to two years ago when I launched I Hate Fairyland, mm -hmm. when, I, when I decided to lose or launch I Hate Fairyland, if you were to look at the setup of my career, one would tell you it's a no-brainer, right? right? The covers sell X amount per unit. They add 10,000 units per book that they're on. There's all these, this math that goes into it. But I still thought, just like Jason was thinking, like, well, I just walked out of Marvel. Yeah, I'm not walked out. I still do so, but I mean, like, I'm leaving the safety net yeah, exactly. of these big characters. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing Rocket Raccoon and Groot, and I'm gonna do this weird maniac little girl who kills yeah. stuff and makes really bad dad jokes. I don't, you know, like, yeah. like that did not. I, I was, const I, I actually thought like, I've done it. Like. I had a good ride. <laughs> nice yeah, I had a good ride, and now I'm just like, <laughs> this will be the thing that they're like, oh, we were really into him, but yeah. not so much. You know, it's like, it, I was like, I don't know, it's like Jack Black myself or something, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. like, Jack Black's the biggest thing on the planet, <laughs> and all of a sudden you're like, really? Yeah, yeah. that one? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you do that? Gulliver's yeah. Travel? Uh, so, it, that feeling also never changes, no matter what level of stuff. So that idea of keep of keep like sticking to your guns and thinking about things and going, okay, comedy books aren't really burning up the chart. It, it was kind of a repeat of 2007 and 8 when the Oz thing was. For me, it was like comedy things don't. I don't know how they work. I mean, even with Rocket Raccooning, when I pitched that, they were like, hey, when you start doing interviews on the press thing, like, because I at the at the retreats, I just kept being like, all right, guys. I'm gonna be doing this like my Looney Tunes, right? It's my Looney Tunes, my Mad Magazine book, and all the editors are like, and the marketing people are like, no, don't oh, say that. Yeah. Like, don't. We just tell them it's an incontinuity. Right. <laughs> we'll say like, don't, you know, don't be saying this Looney Tunes stuff. Right. Um, but you just do it anyway because that's how you see it, right? Yeah. It never changes, no matter what level of success or not you have. You just keep 
it's just our way that our brains work. We're fearful, we're excited, we're, it's all the stuff. But the thing that sticks out to me about every time I go to Los Angeles is the people who are insufferable are the people who have nothing in their hands. Right. They're the people that are like, please fill up my hands. The people who seem happy are the people who go out there and ha they're like, I have this thing yeah. that yeah, I'm going to make or I want to get made or I want to do. And I yeah. feel that is a corollary to this. That's huge. You know, that's a, that's a big thing. And, and I mean, you know, the, I don't know if you know this about me or not. I know that I feel that we have talked about this, but if we haven't, it's no, you know, people remember me being 18, 19, 20, selling mixtapes out of my backpack at the colleges that I did not go to right. and things like that. When I was a kid, I, I was so into music and everybody remembers that when video stores first opened, right? That every small town got their very first, ours was literally called small town video. You, you know, you go up and you rent your VHS tape and you bring it back. And I love that concept so much. And I had so many cassette tapes. <laughs> this is amazing. You started a, like, a, like a video store for cassette tapes. I took my case to school every day. Nice. I taped a list of what I had to the side of my desk, right? And you could rent my tapes. You, could, you rent my tapes for a week, for the week in third grade. Did you have to, ever have to like go after and break his legs? Yeah, one dude didn't bring. One dude, one dude rented my. One dude rented my Bullet Boys yeah. tape, but he didn't bring the yeah. cover back. Yeah, that's and amazing. I was so mad. Y'all like, remember that cover too, with yeah. the apple and the bullet? Yeah, you got a loan oh, shark. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see that wiffle bat real quick. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, man, that was so, that, that hustle, it was. Hey, Bill, you got my EPMD? Yeah, no, it was, I, I might not have rented out my EPMD. I was afraid it wouldn't come back. And there is like, I think about that all the time when I'm walking through the show floor, the idea that this is just a straight up weird ass hustle. It is, man. It, it is just a straight, like as much as we, I love it and I'm pretentious about it and I'm like, this is an art form and a medium, there's a certain point where it's like, this could all end for any of us tomorrow. Yeah, man, we're just slinging tapes out of backpacks. <laughs> if Malcolm Gladwell's anywhere close to right, I got 10 years. Right. So it's like if I hit 50, 50, I'm gonna crush 50, this. I would crush this. And like, you know, then I got like a good 10 years and I'm retired. Right. I mean, I think that book was kind of dead on. Like, like pretty close. Yeah. Like if you look at all of us, like because we're the same age and we kind of got around in the same time. And if you look at the ten-year mark of us in in around this business, about the ten-year mark is when everything kind of went and like evened out. I'd like to see a study of like people who then go on to do other things. Like once they master it, yeah, yeah. master it. I've always say I translate that as um, I'm not the best at it, but I do it comfortably. Yeah, exactly. Meaning like I'm not scared to do it anymore. Like there was a time I was literally scared to go to the table because it was going to beat me. Because I know like one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because I want to sort of put it out there if I fail, like if people are like, oh, that's really fucking clumsy. Right. I like the idea of people seeing me try stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, of course. Um, and I like the idea of me having that record. I feel like that's what I've been doing with comic account. books my whole career uh, yeah, is trying. Yeah, that's what we do. You know, because we have to do it so fast. That it's you're virtually just throwing a test out at all times, right? Yes, I woke up like two days ago and almost was like the thought was overbearing. I was gonna say, I was gonna say one of these days we're all gonna wake up and realize we made the most talented artists in the world work with a gun to their head every month. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know, like we 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 took this whole we, generations of people and made them like existentially. Right. <laughs> like crisis mode like for like half their lives. Running. Yeah, exactly. And like what, now granted, you know, we got some amazing stuff out of that, but I don't know, like what would have we? I feel like the, but, the gun's not even to our head. I feel like the gun's been fired, but we've somehow <laughs> been given the power to run just slightly faster yeah. than the bullet. The gun is a drill. <laughs> just slowly. <laughs> yeah, it's uh. Time. We got really deep on time.